why do you still love music so much? Well, it must be in my DNA and in my bones because I feel strongly that everything I do about performing is what keeps me healthy inside and outside. I don't think I would be able to function if I didn't do this. I think it kind of checks all the boxes of what I need emotionally, physically, spiritually, and I need to satisfy that 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 great uh, opportunity to sing in public. That's what I was really born to do. So I, I was lucky to be born in a situation where my father was a great musician and a great singer. And he had a profession for, he had a radio show for 30 years. And, and he was also literate and interested and read everything that was necessary to read to be a, an intellectual person and uh, taught me all kinds of things about how to show up and how to not break down when you're having problems and just go ahead and do your work. So all those disciplines that I learned as a child, including being a concert pianist and having to practice every day for two hours and to really focus on what I was doing have been part of what's carried me through because, you know, we always say in this business that we don't get paid for the performance we get paid for the traveling <laughs> yeah yeah so many people say that and uh, is there is there ever a night that, that you're playing a, a concert and you think oh this isn't for me no i i never think that i think this is always for me and if it wasn't up to par it will be tomorrow and there's you, always tomorrow well yeah you're saying it, it, it sounds like you hold yourself to a very high standard. And and I mean, you, you know, your, your records and your live performances, you, you wouldn't be here today still still touring um, and having sold so many records and, and all, all the other kind of accolades without um, those high standards. So do, is there anything that you need to do now, having had um, such a long career and so much experience, is, is there anything that you need to do now still in terms of, of practice or taking care of the voice or, or, or is it quite a natural thing for you? Well, I have to keep on doing all the things that I'm doing. There are some things that fall naturally into place. For instance, another new book. I've written many books in my history. I've been, written nine or 10 books. And um, I'm working on a new book, which is a book of poetry. And then there's another uh, big book about singing, actually. It's called The Voice. So there are more books to come. There are opportunities in the area of documentary which is being worked on that'll happen in the coming year and a half um, a broadway show which is finally i finally have found the person that i think knows what to do with this <laughs> persona and the touring and the the history so there are a lot of things that will happen in the next five years i would think that have to do with sort of securing the the opportunity to look at what I've done through through a uh, documentary, through a Broadway play, through looking at my musical history. You know, I've written about 60 songs since I met Leonard Cohen and he asked me why I wasn't writing songs. <laughs> so there's a lot, to, there's a lot of work to be done. I just have to stay healthy. Yeah, well, it seems like you're doing a very good job of that. And I think those releases will be fascinating you know particularly like you know the documentary just in terms of it's so difficult to get to grips with the huge breadth of work that you've put out and and all the oh. different projects and the amount you know you're just writing one book that could be someone's entire life work right. uh, one album you've you've done so much is there something that you feel you know attracted like a deep cut or an album that got kind of got missed due to the wrong promotion or is this something that you've done over the course of your career that you feel was like particularly overlooked compared to let's say your biggest hits ah uh, that's a good question overlooked well things get overlooked in one's history because you can't focus on more than one thing at a time so an audience can only really see one one period at a time it's interesting that you ask that because, of course, I do my usual uh, tour. It's a trio tour now, a guitarist and 
pedal steel player and piano and me. But I also do a series now, I've done now, now already 25 of them, I think, a series of concerts with orchestras, everything from a 57 piece orchestra to a string quartet. And I'm what I'm doing is playing the album that I made in 1967 called Wildflowers, which has, for instance, it has the first uh, performance of both sides now on it. It has my first three albums. It has three of Leonard Cohen's songs. It has a uh, Jacques Brel song, Chanson de Vieux Amour. Amour. Uh, and it's it's been something that people have asked me if I would do throughout the years. And um, the Boston Pops called us last year and said, we'd like to put together, help you financially put together the money to uh, recreate those orchestrations, which were written by Josh Rifkin in 1967. And we got that done and we've we've been out with it. Now it's going out all over the country and f frankly, all out of the world. So that's, that's a very interesting flashback and people get to experience hearing that album that they've played. Many of them bought it when they were young and they bought it and they played it and they wore it out. And now they're hearing it fresh with all those gorgeous, uh, gorgeous uh, orchestrations. And also that I'm at 84, I'm singing them all in the same key, <laughs> which is- Yeah, that's no mean feat. And, and, and in terms of keeping the voice, like hitting, hitting those notes, do you have to do, you know, do you have to start the day doing like scales or something like that? Or is it just your voice has stayed in great condition because you've stayed healthy? Well, I don't, I don't have to sing every day, but I try to because it keeps everything in order. And um, so I, I'm perpetually working on that aspect, which is the focus on the clarity and the, um, the clarity and the phrasing of anything that I'm singing. So I have to keep that first and foremost in my mind when I'm working and when I'm not working. I've just had a bad cold from a few days. We had a an influx of smoke in New York and other parts of the United States. Oh uh, yeah, I saw that. In Canada. And I got I was out in it last week, a week ago. Um, a week ago, what's today, Friday? A week ago, Wednesday. And I caught something really strange and I was without a voice for four or five days. And of course that can really, I had to cancel a couple of things, which is very unusual for me. So, you know, that's where you kind of re regroup and you retread and you get through the coughing stage and you try to take all the right remedies. And then you wake up and go, la, 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 la. And, you know, <laughs> and you think, oh, it's back. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I saw that. That looked crazy, that um, smoke. It was crazy. A lot of people got sick. I thought I was having a heart attack. I thought I was having a stroke. But what it did was to hit the vocal cords. So, Well, yeah, it must it must be rare that you've um, cancelled things, but pretty understandable in that case. When Very did you first um, realise that you wanted to, to be a singer? What, what was the moment that, uh, that, that it struck you? Or did somebody tell you you had an amazing voice? Well, I was raised in a very musical family. So from the very beginning, we were all singing. And I knew that, you know, I was five, four or five years old when I started studying piano and singing in all the choirs, choruses, the choirs, the church, the school. And I was performing all kinds of shows and starring in, uh, in uh, what's it called? When you sing, someday my prince will come. I can't. Yeah, I met uh, Cinderella. I started okay. Cinderella when I was about 11 years old. So from from the time I was five, I was singing in all kinds of situations and singing in the operas and the choruses and singing in the choirs and singing on stage and finding a guitar when I was 16. So I've always been doing this. I've always been performing in some way or other. So that's been very important to developing a way to work and a way to be happy on the road. I'm very happy on the road. A lot of people don't like it. I love it. <laughs> it gives why, me a chance. Why don't people like being on the road? Well, it's not, <clears throat> easy. it's not easy. It's, um, it's demanding. It's, 
Anyway, I happen to thrive with the road. And so that's where this particular career that I have is nicely cut out just for me. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very important. And you hear uh, younger artists, um, a lot, kind of more younger artists, I feel, saying that they don't like the road and they uh, find touring difficult and they're not going to tour anymore and they got to cancel this tour or that tour um, just because they want to go home type of thing. I know, I know. Uh, I know. So it's it's clearly very um, grueling. Are, are there... Um, you know, do you listen to much modern pop music? Are there artists who you feel like really have the potential to recapture some of the magic that was going on in like the 60s and 70s? There are some and I love them. Um, I'm particularly fond of uh, Sean Colvin and and uh, Mary Beth, uh, um, Mary Beth Carpenter, I think her name is. And I discovered a woman named Mary Fall, whom I love a lot. And uh, I've listened to a lot of different music and Ari Hest has come into my life as a wonderful force and talent. And I've made a record with him and I sometimes tour with him. And so I, I but I listen to a lot of classical music. I listen to Bach and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff. And I'm, I'm always listening to something and I'm always working on something, trying to get it better. Also, you know, touring for me is like a, it's like belonging to a very, very exotic health club. It keeps you on. It keeps you on the move. It makes you have to be very specific about your healthy routines: how you eat, your sleeping, what you do to exercise. You know, I have this. I I forgot to take this vest off. I have a weight of weighted vest that weighs about eight pounds. I'm working now because I have a. I have pretty bad osteoporosis and I won't take any of those drugs. So I'm using a whole weight, um, weight centered exercise regime. And I've always done exercise ever since I was about 20. Uh, I guess I was 23 when I started exercising and uh, trying to control the alcohol and the weight and the food. So that's always something that's on your mind. You know, how do you live healthy? in this world that's filled with all the wrong kind of food <laughs> yeah a lot of people struggle on the road and um with that, yeah. with that stuff and they don't they don't exercise but it sounds like you've maintained that type of discipline from a very young age uh, yeah so, i have even during the days of partying i didn't exercise well <laughs> when i was young you know i did my share of course but um and i drank a lot and i drank for just the right amount of time about 20 years <laughs> until I until I caved in and and surrendered, um, so I've been sober now for forty five years, and that of course is partly what makes it possible to do what I do. I mean, I think well, first of all, I'm sober, so I'm healthy, and I eat properly. You know, one of the things that's helped me a lot, a lot lately is Starbucks has come up with something called egg white bites. And they cost, I don't know, maybe $9. And there are two in a little package. And it's egg whites with, with pimento. It It's the most wonderful, inexpensive way to eat protein without getting fat. So, and I can make an egg white omelet to really knock your socks off. I'm going to make one tonight, as a matter of fact, with lots of uh, browned onions and a big salad and so on. So, you know, we have, we, we eat pretty much everything anyway, but I really focus on getting the cholesterol out of the out of the food and getting the best thing possible and making a fabulous salad uh, mm -hmm. and and trying to eat simply wherever I go. So that's helped a lot. I mean, I've been I've been through every diet known to man, I think. But but what I find is that simple is the best way. Yeah, particularly with everything that you've got going on. So playing now with orchestras. And, uh, and, you know, letting those kind of string arrangements shine. You mentioned um, both sides now. Um, and, and and also you earlier mentioned how, you know, Leonard Cohen said, why aren't you writing your own songs? But of course, was but would you would you describe and um, do you look back at both sides now as, as a very pivotal moment in your career in the sense that it was one of the first like hit singles? Um, well, it was it was important. Um, 
And the fact that I got to record it and that I was the first person to record it, including uh, Joni, who recorded it later on. After, yeah. And it's a, it was an enormous hit. And so that's a great thing to have in your catalog is an enormous hit. But also there was everything else. I had already made seven records, six records by the time I found Joni's song. And it was introduced to me in the middle of the night by Al Cooper, who called me. Al Cooper, who started Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Mm. And he called me in the middle of the night. He was at the club listening to the Blood, Sweat, and Tears play. And there was a girl there who said, I write songs. And he said, are they any good? And she said, yeah, they're good. And he said, could I listen to them? And she said, well, why don't you follow me home? So he did at 3 in the morning. And then he she played him both sides now. And he called me and put her on the phone. And she sang me both sides now at three o'clock in the morning where I had waked up from a dead sleep or what you might call a hangover or <laughs> passing out. <laughs> so I was very lucky and it's happened to, to me in other instances too. So, so all I can say is it was a big hit and people said to me, did it change your life? Well, you know what it did in the sense that people started answering my phone calls. <laughs> what was it like before with your phone calls? Well, I mean, getting into a career and then working your ass off is what it takes. And you have to be doing that all the time. So what what happens, you know, when you find a song like that or would you have a big there wasn't not much of it really touched my my life because I was out on the road all the time. So I was always working on the next show, figuring out how, how to get from Cleveland to Tulsa trying to find out when I get home, you know, all of the other preoccupations while that situation with uh, both sides now was going on and everybody else was aware of it, but I really wasn't. Mm. So, so yeah, working out how to get from uh, Cleveland to Tulsa, like in, in the sixties and, and in the seventies, like touring now is very corporate uh, in the sense that, that, you know, there a lot of the tours are managed by big, official companies like live nation and AEG and frontier and all these companies and it, it seems very well organized and very you know business like was it like that back uh, back in the 60s it was and very organized and very business like always from the first i had a wonderful i had wonderful management i worked with incredibly interesting artists i i went out on the road with people like bill lee who just died uh, spike lee's father and I toured a great deal to, together. And um, uh, Bruce Bruce Langhorn, who was the, the uh, inspiration for Tambourine Man, was out on the road with me, a great guitar player. Hmm. So I was on the road. It was very organized. We so, were... so, so it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, sometimes people kind of say that it was, sometimes it was like less organized or more like kind of, cowboys type of situation but it wasn't like that at all was not it just, all. is there is there no in, is there no difference really in terms of in terms of the day to day it was very organized always it had to be i don't think i've been stiffed on any but one concert in all my career and that's amazing and i had very very fine people from the very start and uh you know, in those in those early days, it was very much a word of mouth business. The little clubs, people, you know, somebody from Denver from the Exodus would call the guy who owned the um, uh, the Gate of Horn in Chicago and say, you know, she sold a lot of tickets. You know, she's worth putting on your putting in your. So that's how it went. Word of mouth. Uh, my first manager was uh, Odetta's husband, a guy named Danny Gordon, and uh, he did a great job. And everything was. Because I came from a very disciplined, very organized background in terms of music and doing what is proper in terms of life in general. And musically speaking, I worked with orchestras. I played with an orchestra when I was 13. I was really, I was not a kid and I was not sloppy and I was not driving in a van and I was not sleeping in the rain. I was very disciplined and organized about everything that went on so you it sounds like you had a fantastic kind of team and management almost right from the I, word go. i did and i always have and i'm so grateful for them i can't tell you i mean they're my manager is always hands-on she's helping with the 
with the agent who books my concerts and she gets into the whole structure of of booking and then routing. Routing a series of concerts is it's where the real work goes in yeah. because you have to get it settled so that you know the hotel and you know the venue and you know where you're going tomorrow and you have the everything organized for everybody. I mean, it's it's down to the details. Mm. And and the the wonderful venues that I play, you know, they might be slightly shorthanded nowadays because that's just the time that we live in, but they all do their best. They're all professional. They always do a beautiful job from the lighting and getting our dinners in and getting us on the stage and making sure the audience is there. I mean, that's a big job. I've always said that actually I feel very strongly that my my role in this world is not only to be a singer, an entertainer, an enlightener, an informer, somebody to lift people up, but also I help people make a living. You know, mm -hmm. I have in this context helped many, many hundreds of thousands of people make it through the week, you know, get a paycheck because all the things that I do, paying the cars, paying the airplanes, paying the hotels, paying the food, paying the venue, uh, you know, it's it's being showing up and allowing the venue to make their money. It's a big, <laughs> it's a big part of connecting with the rest of the world. People mm. have to be supported in their making their livings, and I've been lucky enough to help people do that. A hundred percent, yeah. It dri it's drive concerts drive the economy. The local economy yeah. thrives yeah. when uh, big name performers come into town. That's that's for right. sure. The, the so shop that sell food the people who sell the records, you know, the, the the people who run the venues, it's all part of keeping things going. Yeah, because every single person that buys a ticket to that concert is going to spend money on, on, on other things. Exactly. And and uh, so the concert business, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, ha compared to the rest of the world, you know, things are more or less the same, especially the, the way that you're saying it. And, you know, people go and they see live music in person. There's this human element. And yet the way the rest of the music business and the rest of the world is, it's changed so much. And I wanted to ask you what you think. Um, we had yesterday uh, Paul McCartney saying the Beatles are going to release a song, final song, because of AI. Um, where do you see the role? Because there are going to be a lot of, you know, young um, singer songwriters and artists um, who want to follow in your footsteps and, and write brilliant songs and write poetry and you know stuff that comes from the heart and soul. Um, where do you see the role of the arts and of the writer um, in an age where you can type something on a computer? Um, you know, write me a, a lyric like uh, Judy Collins or Bernie Taupin or you know Leonard Cohen or Bob Dylan or, or whoever. And they'll come back and, and you know, it's not that convincing yet, but I mean, I'm pretty scared about how convincing it's it's all getting. Um, how do you see the role of the artist in, in, a, in a kind of um, situation that we seem to be finding ourselves in with AI? You know, the other day I was with a friend of mine who um, I said, what is this all about? And he said, well, look at this program. I can get it on my phone and then I can tell it to write a ballad about you, about Judy Collins, a four stanza poem about your life, and it did. And it was reasonable and believable and accurate and had a lot of things that were familiar to my life and my experience. But I have to say that I have to stay out of that contest or out of that discussion because I don't, I don't know what AI really means to us. I don't know how how much damage it could do. I don't. I know that its intent is by these uh, mechanisms that have learned so much of what we do that they can turn our themselves against us. I know that people feel that AI is determined to remove humans from the planet because they understand how terrible we are and how much damage we've done to the planet. So we're probably in trouble from a lot of angles, but as far as I'm concerned, I have to focus on what I can do. I have to focus on where I can go, how I can make people understand something in themselves that they perhaps didn't understand before and give them, you know, art is the way that we make our way through the 
through the world. I think without painting and music and and uh, poetry and mu and song, I don't and stories. I don't think we would stay on the planet. I don't think we could live through it because it's so devastating in many aspects of its progression. You know, we're all <laughs> we all wound up in a coffin. We all wind up gone. We all have our memories erased and our experience decimated. So the point is to live in the moment and do what you can and be as good as you ever can be. Mm. I read a lot of Marcus Aurelius. I tell my friends, you know, if you get down and upset, just pick up a book of Marcus Aurelius's meditations and read what he thought about when he was leading the Roman army. <laughs> <laughs> or some stoicism and some... Uh, exactly. You know some some reflection uh, i mean it's it sounds like your advice is to just keep doing what uh what artists do anyway keep writing yeah. songs i mean what's what's That's the point in getting distracted uh, and and i guess it's like anything i mean with with the as technology changed with with making records you know as pro tools came in as whatever um you know, how much has that affected the way that you write and make make records, or have you just more or less kept ex just expressing what's in your heart and soul? It hasn't changed what I do or how I do it. It's uh, you know the mechanics of music have nothing to do with the quality of the song, and so what, however they're distributed, however they're made, you know I I go into the studio with a live trio or quartet or sextet. I have. I have a group of people that I record with, it's live. You know, people are thrilled when we come in and we don't have a little thumb drive to put everything in and say, okay, can you fix this? We're a live group and we make music in the moment. And that's what happens on the stage. So I'm, I'm thrilled by the process and I love doing it. And I love being part of what happens emotionally when you're working on something that has been inspired by yourself or by another great writer. And I, I am as comfortable with somebody else's great song as I am with something that I've written that I think is going to pass. <laughs> mm, well, that's, that's for sure. Uh, I mean, was it Amazing Grace that was recently kind of added to the National Register? Yes, it was added to the... the your your uh, version, I might add. Yes, to the uh, Library of Congress. Yeah, amazing. So that's, that's an interpret... Pretty you, complete as well with the amount of cover versions of that song that there are out there. I'm sorry, which one? Uh, so, so it's a very difficult accomplishment to, you know, do a, an interpretation of Amazing Grace, get it into the Library of Con Congress, given, you know, the amount of different cover versions by all manner of artists, everybody from Aretha Franklin to, you know, um, Elvis Presley has done a version of Amazing Grace and yet your version has been chosen to be, to be added. Um you know, it's it's a re really incredible. So you're obviously very good at interpreting other people's songs as well. It's luck and being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> well, it's been a real honour to to talk to you, Judy. Thank you so much for giving oh, your time you. to this podcast. Um, it's truly a, a, an honour. And I just wanted to encourage everybody out there to get tickets um, for when you come to the UK because it is going to be incredible. And um, and one also final uh, thing, you know, if your UK fans and, uh, you know, anyone listening to this, if you wanted to send them in the direction of any of your albums or songs or things that are out there, you know, where where would you tell them uh, to go? What, what should they be listening to? Oh, uh, I would I would go to uh, judycollins.com, first of all, and see what's up. Go to uh, some of the, uh, um, go to iTunes and so on. The new album is called Spellbound. And it was nominated for a Grammy this year. And it's all my own writing, which has been exciting because I haven't written a whole album of my own songs until now. And I want I read I read I I recorded one in about 1980, which was a group of songs, but it wasn't on a CD, it wasn't on an album. So the first uh the first of that order is spellbound. So go get it. Yeah, everybody should go and get that. And the tour is called Big Hits and Spellbound, so uh, so you know people get to hear hear some of that. And uh, starting on the twenty eighth of September, finishing on the tenth of October. And yeah, JudyCollins.com. Thank thank you so much, Judy. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. God yeah. bless.
Take yeah, care. I hope the tour goes well and uh, have, a, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Bye. Tom. Bye. Bye. Do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com 